You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 89, covering the week of September 11th through 15th, 2017. Glad to have you back on the program. Glad to be here. Before we get started, all the usual housekeeping stuff. If you do like this podcast, please share it around on social media. And you can find us on social media. You can find us on Facebook at Abbeville Institute, on Twitter at Abbeville INST. And, of course, you can subscribe to our YouTube page. Just go out and look for Abbeville Institute. And if you don't want to search for all those things on our social media platforms, you can go to our webpage, www.abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all of our social media buttons. You can click on those things, and you take you right to our social media pages. So you can do that there. Also, on the top of that page with those buttons, you'll see our Amazon Smile button. If you want to make the Abbeville Institute your designated charity for Amazon Smile, you can throw a few pennies our way as you go and shop at Amazon. Also, if you go to our uh, homepage and you give us an email, we will give you a free book, free ebook, Kirkpatrick Sales Emancipation Hell. And you will be given our daily dose of Dixie, Monday through Friday, and our weekly email on Saturday. Plus, it will also get you uh, emails, communication from us about upcoming events uh, and other things that we're doing. So go on out there and give us that email, and uh, you'll get on our email list. And you'll also get the, the uh, free ebook for it, so you can't beat that. Uh, also remember that the Abbeville Institute exists on your generous contributions alone. At the top of the page on abbevilleinstitute.org, you will see a uh, tab, and you drop that. It'll say support. You drop that tab down, and it'll give you the option of donating to the Institute. You can donate as little as $3 a month or $25 a year if you're a student, or $5 a month and uh, $50 a year if you're not a student. But all of those things help keep the uh, Abbeville Institute going, help keep the podcast going, the website going, help keep our programs going. So uh, if you do like what we do and you want to help us explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, you can do so. And we appreciate any support uh, that you give us. Okay, all of that said, let's talk about this week at the Abbeville Institute. And of course, the first article for the week is something we've been discussing a lot at the website. And it is entitled A Monumental Folly by John Marcourt. Uh, and so this uh, article is actually written before some other things happened this week. Um, in, in the past a week or so, we had the Francis Scott Key Monument in uh, Baltimore vandalized. Uh, we've had um, the Thomas Jefferson statue at UVA covered up uh, by students, quote-unquote students there. And, of course, these are all things the American Historical Association has sworn would never happen. Uh, We're not going to get to that point. We're just going to take down Confederate statues. Nobody's going to go after the Founding Fathers. Nobody's going to go after the Founding Generation. Nobody's going to go after anyone else. Uh, We're just going to focus on Confederate statues. Once we get rid of those miserable things... Uh, we are, uh, you know, going to uh, going to purge our society of all these terrible things, and then society will be better. And no one, everyone, will stop there. There's no slippery slope. This is just a complete fallacy from those who are trying to scare people into not supporting removing Confederate statues. Of course, they're completely wrong as usual. And uh, John's uh, Jack's article here uh, gets into that, um, and so. He talks about uh, how this is just the beginning uh, and how other things, how there's, <laughs> there are other types of memorials that are being uh, covered up, removed, not just statues, not just statues, uh, but uh, plaques to Confederate prisoners of war. For example, the, the picture on, these, on this particular article uh, is from a a plaque or basically a monument in Massachusetts dedicated to Confederate prisoners of war uh, who died in this particular cemetery. That has now been covered up. It's it's Fort it's at Fort Warren in Boston Harbor. That was covered up by the governor of Massachusetts. Uh, it was placed there over a century ago by the UDC, and it was designated a national historical landmark, but it's been covered up. I mean, this is the kind of stuff we're going to start seeing. 
uh, you know, six flags in Texas. Now it's just one flag because you don't want to offend anybody. We've seen that before where, uh, you know, these, these states like Florida, Texas are taking down the Confederate flag out of, uh, you know, because we don't want to offend anyone. I guess they don't realize that also the Spanish flag and the British flag and the uh, French flag all also flew over slavery. I mean, that's, I, I guess that's, that, that just doesn't matter. And even the U.S. flag, uh, that, that flew over slavery too. Uh, but only the one is uh, seen as a symbol of slavery now. Uh, it, it's ridiculous what we've gotten to. And of course, this is historical amnesia of the worst kind. It's stupidity of the worst kind. Um, the, the, uh, he talks about a, a, um, uh, in Brunswick, Maine, uh, there is a uh, plaque for uh, Confederate alumni of uh, Bowdoin College there that's been removed uh, because there were Confederate alumni. You can't have that. You can't recognize that we had Confederate uh, you know, soldiers that attended our college and, and, and uh, recognizing their contribution to American history. You can't do that. Uh, we've had things like uh, Christopher Columbus statues in New York just, you know, damaged. Uh, you know, a former memorial, uh, memorial to former Philadelphia Mayor Frank Rizzo is, uh, has been taken down. You know, Confederate, uh, I'm sorry, not Confederate, but uh, statues at Catholic schools are being removed. This is beyond, this is beyond just Confederate statues. The entire point of this is to destroy Western civilization. That's the point. It has nothing to do with the South. It has nothing, ultimately, has nothing to do with the Confederacy. It has everything to do with destroying Western civilization. And those that don't think this is a slippery slope are not paying attention. These Confederate statues, again, are the low-hanging fruit. It's not going to stop there. It won't stop there. And so I think that this, you know, Jack calls it monumania. Uh, it just, just, it's, um, it's iconoclasm. Just go out there and, and take this stuff down, destroy it. And, of course, this is going to make everyone feel better. And the amount of money that's being spent on these things, taxpayers should be riding in the streets. Uh, you know, the, the, the statue just came down in Dallas, for example, the Lee statue there. cost half a million dollars to take down. Now, people don't think that the city could have better spent half a million dollars? Or the amount of money that was required to take down these statues in New Orleans while their drainage systems, their pumps are all broken and not working, so when they get flooding, the city floods. But no, we took down these statues because, uh, you know, that's, um, it's going to help us feel better. It's ridiculous. Uh, but this is where we are. And, uh, again, people need to, to understand what's happening here. It is a fundamental, a fundamental uh, shift in uh, American thought. Without question, uh, we are dealing in, with a situation that we have, I, I don't think it's ever been dealt with before. I mean, I guess you could look at Reconstruction and, uh, and the viciousness of Reconstruction in the South and say that's a very similar time. But the people that are advocating these statues, advocating removing these statues and removing these plaques, they have a whole different vision of American society. Uh, of what uh, America is than the people that want them to remain, which is the majority of the population, by the way. Uh, and when you look at what they're doing, I mean, this is um, this is some of the worst things we say. Really, you haven't seen this stuff in, in the world since uh, the French Revolution, in, in my estimation, from uh, since the Communist Revolution and, and, and the Soviet, you know, what became the Soviet Union, or maybe since Pol Pot, in, uh, in Cambodia. That's what we're dealing with here. Now, we haven't gotten to the wholesale uh, you know, arrest and execution of people for believing in these things. And I, thankfully, I don't think we're going to see that. But what these people are trying to do is remake society. Um, and, and that's what you saw in the French Revolution. You ditch the calendar. Uh, you ditch religion. Uh, you tear down things that had anything to do with the old regime. Um, and uh, that was the point of it all. You, know, you get the metric system, right? He's, the, other, the old uh, system was uh, smacked of monarchy, so we get the metric system. Uh, and and we, we have 10-day weeks, and uh, we call each other citizen. I mean, you do all these things to try to remake the entire culture of society, to, to remake society entirely itself. 
to remove any vestiges of what could be considered, you know, bad stuff. So um, this is only the beginning. And of course, as I said, we've talked about these things before. On our Facebook page, we ran a, an image of a, of a professor at the uh, University of, of Southern Mississippi, uh, a guy who goes out there and, and uh, they're having a protest. They've had it for weeks now uh, because the, uh, the university there has decided not to fly the state flag of Mississippi, even though it's a state-funded institution. It's saying we're not flying the state flag of Mississippi. So you've had people come out with state flags to protest that. And now you've got a professor along with some other uh, you know, malcontent students, I guess they're students, or I don't know, uh, that are out there you know, flipping people the bird and cussing them out and threatening violence. Um, I mean, this is, again, these people are just sitting in lawn chairs with the state flag of Mississippi. This is where we got into You can't even fly the state flag, the, the democratically uh, approved state flag, because now that somehow offends people. Uh, at a state institution, no less. And this professor is paid with state money. It, it's, it's ridiculous. So uh, you know, we're going to keep talking about these things. Uh, we will, and we had another piece this week that gets into you know, the, uh, some, some issues with the war. Uh, but sometimes we like to change gears, and so we did that a couple of times this week. Actually, three times. Three of the pieces were a little bit different. Um, and the Tuesday piece was a book review by Randall Ivey entitled That Old Black Magic, and it was uh, Fred... Chapel's Familiars, which is a collection of poetry. And Fred Chapel, of course, is a Southern literary figure. And so it's nice every now and then to give us a break from uh, the uh, all the terrible things going on in Southern society, all of the things that are uh, happening that make us angry or uh, make us depressed about, you know, the future of America. And not just, not just uh, you know, what's happening here with these statues, but what is America going to look like in 20 years? Um, what's going to happen? Um, and so you know, it's nice to, to kind of retreat at times and say, well, there still is Southern culture. Even if all these symbols go away, that's something we have to understand. If all the symbols go away, everyone takes the statues, everyone takes the flags, Confederate, all this Confederate stuff is gone. Southern symbols are just a representation of Southern culture and society. And as long as you have them, it's like the green flag in Ireland. It was illegal, but people kept it. And they kept writing the songs, and they kept writing the literature. And eventually that green flag came back. It bloomed again, as uh, the uh, Tommy Maycomb wrote in Four Green Fields. Uh, his, their fourth green field would bloom again. Uh, so you just have to keep that in mind. It's easy to get down. But as long as you can keep it, and even in your own home, in your own heart, and we can keep talking about Southern literature and music and manners and religion, Southern society, the things that made you know, the, the things that made Southern society great, the ideas of Jeffersonian uh, uh, government, as long as we can keep that alive, it will come back. It will bloom again. Uh, even the, the terrorists of the French Revolution didn't last forever. Now, France was forever changed, but you go to France and they still have the crown jewels on display. I mean, that uh, you can still go to the Palace of Versailles as a tourist attraction, but it's still there and people still recognize the old regime and what it was and the beauty of it and splendor of it. And while they may not want to live in the old regime, there is still a recognition of what it was and what it meant to Western civilization. And you find that all over Europe. And I think eventually you're going to find that in uh, the United States as well, in the South, and what that meant. As long as we can keep things like the Abbeville Institute alive and, and talk about what was true and valuable in the Southern tradition as the last bastion of Western civilization, real Western civilization in uh, the United States, uh, it, it'll eventually come back. And of course, this particular collection of poetry has nothing to do with uh, you know recognizing the grandeur of the old South or of uh, Southern culture. Other than that, it's a great collection of poems. And of course, we have a great Southern author, and um, uh, it's a it's a great uh, uh, look at, at uh, a, a Southern writer and, and how he uh, engages his audience. And most of this stuff is about cats. Uh, <laughs> And so it's kind of funny. 
Um, but it's also it's also uh, you know a, a, a look at uh, how Southerners fit within contemporary literature, as as uh, as uh, Randy says here at the in the in the concluding paragraph. Um, he says, to some extent, Familiars is an, is an ironic title for a book of poetry such as this. For chapels is an approach to verse that is becoming less familiar. His work does not partake of the obscure, the ostentatiously personal, the sensational, the maddeningly abstract. Manningly abstract. His mystery of rhyme and traditional form would set him squarely in the school of the formalist, a brave band of dissidents seeking to return some sanity to the writing of poetry. And think about that phrase for a second, what we're doing here at the Abbeville Institute, and what you're doing by listening to this podcast, and, and what you're doing by contributing to the Institute. You're, you're with a brave band of dissidents who want to, re, to, want to return some sanity to, to American culture, American society. Doesn't mean we're always going to be successful. Doesn't mean it's always going to work out. It doesn't mean that we're going to face defeat at times. But you don't stop trying. Uh, you don't stop trying. And I think that's why I like this particular piece. Because of that one sentence. Because that's what we do at the Institute. Try to return some sanity to life. To remember these things. Remember who we are, as Mel Bradford said. We need to remember who we are. And uh, by engaging literature or music or art, southern art, uh, you know, agriculture, getting out there in the dirt, having a little garden in your yard, just trying to connect in some way with the past and what it is, in the past of the Old South, you, you can, or even the New South. I mean, you, you, Southern tradition overall, as I've talked about, there is some continuity between the Old and the New. And as you know, it's it's uh, it's important to remember that. So, as you can connect with these things in, in Western civilization itself, Southern thinkers, even you know, post-war Southern thinkers like Richard Weaver and Mel Bradford. The, uh, and then, of course, the agrarians who were writing before the war, but then also after the war. Uh, as you can do that, you, know, you, you, you become familiar with this formality, some sanity, traditional form to society. That's why we have the fences. That's why these traditions are there. Uh, and we can find what's good in some of the traditions. We can we can discard stuff that we don't. Um, but uh, and people do that all the time. It's always happened. But that's why we're here to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Now the piece on Wednesday by uh, Bo Trawick, "Slavery and the War." Again, it's a it's a it's an interesting piece that goes after this this idea that slavery was the entire cause of the war. Um, and uh, Mr. Trawick is quite explicit from the beginning. Slavery did not cause the war. He says the North itself admitted it in the New York Times. This is from the Times, quote, this is uh, 1861, before the firing on Fort Sumter, quote, slavery has nothing whatever to do with the tremendous issues now awaiting decision. It has disappeared almost entirely from the political decisions of the day. No one mentions it in connection with our present complications. The question which we have to meet is precisely what it would be if there were not a Negro slave on American soil. So it doesn't matter. If there, if there were no slaves here, the questions would be the same. Of course, Lincoln said that somehow slavery caused the war. Somehow. Uh, and... Uh, as he goes on to say, as uh, Bo says, to strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object, this is what Lincoln is saying now, was the object for which the insurgents would render the Union, uh, would rend the Union even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with, or even before, the conflict itself should cease. And as Bo says, that was because that which ceased was not the cause. What caused the conflict was not slavery, but northern imperialism, and northern imperialism did not cease with the surrender at Appomattox. And so uh, he gets into that. 
we have to remember that uh, there were those, there were still slave states in the Union when the Deep South seceded, and that they only came to the cause of secession after Lincoln invaded or called up 75,000 troops to invade the South. And when you look at the war in the long durée, in the long perspective, and you start talking about the sectional conflict, what was underlying the sectional conflict? Uh, as I often tell my students, when you go back to the 17th century and you find that the Puritans, who were dominant in Massachusetts and Connecticut and New Hampshire and these areas, had a fundamentally different culture than the uh, Cavaliers and Celts who dominated Southern society. When you find that, their vision of, of the world was completely different, even though they were both English, British subjects, eventually. Uh, their vision of the world was different. This cultural, uh, cultural vision was different. So even before you had issues pop into that, you find differences. When you look at the Philadelphia Convention and, that, and the discussions which led to that, and the discussions themselves at Philadelphia, people recognized, we've got a North, we've got a South. And it's not just about slavery that made them different. And they said that. So we have this union that has uh, specifically defined powers, and that's because if we go beyond those powers, this union will not work anymore. And you could take any issue and place it in those specifically defined powers, and there was conflict over it. And as Bo says, you know, objective look at the fact shows it was neither Southern slavery nor Northern abolitionist agitation, but rather the act of Southern secession itself that provoked the North into inaugurating war against the Southern states. So... That was what caused the war. Secession caused the war. Now, we can, you have to deal with these questions separately. If there was no secession, would there have been a war? No. But it's because Lincoln would not allow the states to go. I mean, look, abolitionists for years have been clamoring for secession themselves. And there were abolitionists after the Deep South that seceded said, good, good riddance, we still have the Union. Now, of course, you still had slave states in it, so what are you going to do with those? Um, as as Bo says, it was just another war of conquest, cloaked in robes of morality, selective emancipation of Confederate but not Northern slaves, and the enfranchisement of Southern but not Northern blacks during Reconstruction were merely the smelly red herrings that the North dragged across the tracks of her imperialism. Once she had realized her economic and political ambitions, she abandoned her Southern black political dupes to the poverty and racial hatred she had engendered, and turned her attention to the Plains Indians, who were in the way of her transcontinental railroads, which is completely true. Uh, as uh, Hiram Rhodes' rebels realized, and he wrote a very famous letter, and we have it on the, on the website, just look for Hiram Rhodes' rebels, and it was a piece that I actually wrote, that uh, he realized that black Southerners were just pawns in this great political game. That was it. The idea was to make sure that black Southerners stayed in the South so that they could vote so that Republicans could win elections. If you started you know, dispersing them throughout the United States, well, that's going to cause problems because you weaken their political power at that point. They no longer control the state, and so therefore uh, they no longer are going to give you those states in the election cycle. So this, again, is, is an attack on this idea that... Uh, you know, slavery caused the war. No, slavery didn't cause the war. Lincoln himself said, "This is this, the, the question was not about slavery at that point. It's about maintaining the Union. The New York Times said it. It's about maintaining the Union. Whatever that is, this mythical Union. Uh, okay, on Thursday we ran a piece entitled Madisonian Liberal by Joe Wolverton. And um, this gets into how uh, the... John Locke and, uh, and James Madison, who were liberals. I mean, they were liberals of their time. But they wouldn't be liberals today. They, they're classical liberals. And so you, know, you, you wrestle with this situation. In, you know, back in the, uh, I guess it was uh, uh, early 80s, you know, Ronald Reagan said that I've, I've always been a liberal. You all just stole the term. 
And so he gets into this idea of, you know, what that is. What is, uh, what is a modern liberal? Well, we're seeing it. We're seeing it uh, in places like Virginia where they cover up the statue of Thomas Jefferson. We're seeing it with these attacks on, on uh, free speech, on, uh, on monuments. Essentially, a modern liberal is a totalitarian who does not believe in freedom of anything. We don't want you to be able to practice uh, your religion unless we agree with it or unless you're some persecuted class of people. Then you can practice your religion all day. But if you're a Christian, no. No, you can't. Uh, we can't have any uh, religious discourse in public uh, society unless you're, again, a, a recognized class of people who we believe are oppressed, and then you can practice your religion however you want in public society. But Christians, no. No, we can't have that. Uh, free speech. No way. We don't need free speech. Just for us. Because we're the tolerant ones. But if we de deem what you're saying intolerant or offensive, we're going to say you can't have free speech. Free press, no can have free press. Uh, free press is, uh, is dangerous, so we have to ensure that we don't offend people. Uh, we're going to write news stories that, uh, that are fake or not, don't have all the facts all the time. So we're going to do these type of things and try to demonize people. Uh, so we have modern liberals that are the antithesis of a Madisonian liberal who believed in individual liberty, particularly when it came to religion, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, religious liberty was something that uh, was practiced. Uh, and of course, I mean, this is something we forget. As he says, liberals in the 21st century would scoff at the suggestion that evangelical efforts should be kept safe from government meddling. Moreover, they would consider any potential harm such uh, partiality to Christianity could cause as irrelevant, an example of, of um, egocentricity. In fact, anyone suggesting paying even passing attention to matters of faith, particularly the Christian faith, would be mocked and marginalized. This is true. But again, if you're in a... In a what's deemed a persecuted class of people, then we don't want to do that. So what is liberalism? I mean, it's the... Liberalism is okay. Classical liberalism is okay uh, because of its real belief in, in intellectual exchange. We've, we've lost all of that. So uh, I think that's important to understand. Uh, when we when we talk about what is a liberal, there are classical liberals and then modern liberals, and they are different animals entirely. Last piece of the week was entitled Yankee Rush, and again, it's a it's a short story, uh, a little different, and it's by Paul Yarbrough. So he does a lot of, of uh, you know great little op eds for us that uh, talk about the issues of the day, but this one does it in a way that's a lot more fun because the story is. Uh, there's a couple guys sitting on their porch, and this uh, Yankee comes barreling down the road in his uh, Toyota uh, Prius, and uh, he is stopping to bring him a package. Um, and uh, the the fact is, you know, he he can't understand why they have dirt roads in the South. Um, and he has this conversation with these two Southerners. Why don't you put? Uh, why don't you pave this road? Well, we can't because that's going to harm the chickens. Uh, why don't you put some gravel down? Gravel costs money, and uh, chickens can't peck through gravel. Uh, you know, why don't you just buy uh, chickens and eggs at the store, and uh, you could have a nice yard? And they said we don't want a nice yard. Uh, we just have to water it. Hose water costs money. Rainwater don't. Uh, and of course, the chickens keep the termites away. And um, and so then the Yankee steps up on the porch and hands the pair the package. Um, and uh, and then he said, well, you know, you got chemicals, get rid of termites. And then, of course, these guys say you got to keep buying chemicals. Ch chickens can redo themselves. And uh, so then they ask, you, you've been a mailman? And, of course, he said, yeah, I was a mailman for 10 years. And so uh, why, he asked, why would you leave New Jersey or wherever it was uh, to come here? 
He said, I lived in Boston. Well, then they said, why'd you come here? And this is what the Yankee responds. He said, well, I got tired of the cold winters, the crowds everywhere, everybody pushing and a shoving and in a hurry, the smokestacks with the toxic fumes pouring out and food prices are so high, and freeways and parking lots was always uh, taking over everywhere. I just asked for a transfer so I could go south where the, there's blue skies and warm weather and not so many people to bump into. I needed to live a more relaxing life, you might say. And so they say, well, then you got time for a glass of tea? And he says, no, thanks. I got to hurry and finish my route. And uh, so there is, you know, there is the thing we have. Uh, and this is a this is an issue with the South and what you're seeing. And these monuments are coming down the South, not because people in the South are bringing them down, not because someone from the outside is bringing them. These are people in the South, but a lot of these people uh, have been influenced by Northerners who have moved in. Uh, northern ideas, northern attitudes. So the South is fast becoming not the South anymore, and uh, and uh, that's why we we have the Abbey Bill Institute to remind us, you know, what the South, uh, what the what's good about the South, um, and to remember that, uh, because it's it's we're losing it, we're losing it, and uh, maybe we need to continue exploring what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition, not the things that are that are. Um, what we consider to be unsavory. But what's good about it? And here we have a, a slower way of life, nicer people, nicer climate. If you don't like that, don't come down here. And don't tell us what we should be doing because you did it some way up north. Uh, that's the point. You come to the south to enjoy what the south is, not so you can change it. And we're seeing it all over the south now. And that's why I like this particular piece as well. Well, I hope you like this week at the Abbeville Institute. Until next time, good day.